part of uh, of what we do at our temple is we engage in outreach. We also do in reach. Part of what we do here is we engage in outreach, which means that we we help people convert either from atheism to our tradition or from another version of theism to our tradition. I use the English word convert because it's the, the word which is commonly used. But a lot of times um, that term is used Hey, hey, boys, sit, be quiet. Good job. I use the word convert because it's the, it's the common English term which is associated with the phenomenon I'm talking about. But the, the truth is, is a little bit more nuanced. Um, I remember a Muslim, a Muslim came here and converted to our tradition and he, he asked me, you know, how do I convert? And I said, no, it's not like that. It's not like an Islam where you have to repudiate your prior beliefs. And you know, the same thing happened in Christianity. You have to repudiate your prior beliefs and then accept a new dogma. And then, then you've converted from what you were doing before, which is gonna send you to hell to what you're doing now, which is gonna send you to heaven. So because the term convert is saddled with that kind of baggage, then we prefer more euphemistic terms like outreach. Outreach is when we go reach out to new people, and in reaches when people are already devotees and you help them to grow and you spiritualize, you nurture them. They're already a part of your congregation. But the word convert, um, just thinking about it, the word vert in convert, I'm almost certain comes from the Sanskrit root vrit, which means to turn. And so, vartati, there's, there's Sanskrit verbal roots, vartma, also the same word means path. It's also from the same root vrit. Um, and so to convert somebody means to turn them to turn them. And that, that's true. We turn people from atheists, theists. We get them believing in God. And we also turn people from believing in other traditions to believing in ours. For the most part, Hinduism doesn't really convert people. Hindus are kind of like the Amish where you have families and those people are born into the faith. And so that's mostly what you do. Um, we're not like that. We're followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he was, he was an evangelist. He was a missionary. And so he taught us. Now, most of the people that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was preaching to and converting, they were South Indian Vaishnavas who worshiped Vishnu, but did not worship Krishna. And so he was engaged in converting Vaishnavas to the worship of Krishna. So if you go to South India, um, in many ways you can say that South India is the heart of India. 
Yeah, you know, technically Madhya Pradesh would be the heart of India. The, the name is literally the middle country and it's located more or less in the interior middle of the country. But all of North and part of Southern India got conquered by the Muslims, which is why you've got names like Hyderabad, and Allahabad and Ahmedabad, they're all Islamic names. And so there was the Delhi Sultanate and then it, the, there were the Deccan Wars and things went south and Shivaji fought and, and kept the Muslims out of the far south of India. Now you also had Christian missionaries attacking Kerala by trade Islam also went to Kerala by trade. And so if you go to Kerala, sometimes they call Kerala South Pakistan because the majority of the population there is Christian and, and Islamic. Islam didn't, you know, Islam went through the Middle East and Afghanistan and Pakistan into mm -hmm. India. And that was that was not a peaceful migration they were conquering like alexander the great had done before them alexander the great was stopping in the action um but then there was also peaceful spreading of islam and christianity mainly by trade and so if you look at the largest islamic country in the world it is indonesia, indonesia. and that was entirely done by trade Muslim traders went to Indonesia and they, you know, they shared their faith with the local people there. Um, and they became hugely popular, somewhere between half, half a billion, three quarters of a billion people, almost half of the Islamic population of the world, a third, 40%, something like that, is in Indonesia. It's just it's ridiculous. Um, so it wasn't that Islam only traveled by way of war and conquest. That certainly happened across the Gangetic Plain, across the north of India. But um, when you go towards that western lower seaboard, that southwestern seaboard, Kerala, that was done primarily through trade. And Christians also had to go. That's why they're so popular. You ever been to Kerala? It's it's strange, isn't it? The amount of Muslims and Christians there. Did you notice? There's Jewish people all over India. Jewish people are all over India. Not all over, tiny, 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 but they're spread out. In Mumbai, you find some communities of Jewish people as well. Um, so yeah, in the deep south, not the west, Kerala is an exception, but the deep south, Tamil Nadu especially, Karnataka, lower portion of Karnataka, some portions of Andhra, not the whole thing, some portions of Andhra. Um, Some portions of Od Odisha also. You find that, that the, but especially South, you get groups of Hindus that never came in contact with, uh, with, with Islam. They were never conquered. And amazingly, you find, you find villages of people with blue eyes. And usually they say they came from Kashmir. But you find, you know, I've, I've seen villages of people that everybody has blue eyes. It's quite striking. Indian colored skin, but blue eyes. It's quite a... Also, sometimes you see the lotus shaped eyes, kind of almond shaped eyes. And you, there, there's these cultures of people that, you know, they just, they didn't mix with the Middle East. It's very common in South India. A Brahmin pundit will be able to name 50 generations of his forefathers. In the U.S., generally, you can't remember the name of your great-grandfather. 
And for sure, by the time you get to your great, great grandfather, everyone is forgotten. But it's quite common, 50 generations back, you're looking at 1,000 to 1,200 years, depending on the amount of time between generations. It's usually 20 to 25 years. Um, so anyway, South India is in many ways the heart of Hinduism. And when the Aryans came, the Rig Veda tells the story of the Aryans coming to conquer the Dasyus. And the Dasyus were darker skinned, and the Aryans were lighter skinned, and the Aryans rode on chariots, and the Dasyus did not have chariots, therefore they were defeated in the battle. Similar to what eventually happened later on, the Muslims rolled into Bengal on horseback and decimated the Bengalis who didn't have horseback. Um, was a whole, whole another part, the, the conquest across the Gangetic Plain went all the way to the Bay of Bengal. Um, this is like 13th, 12th, 13th century, somewhere in there. So in many ways, the heart of Hinduism is South India. And in South India, usually you find there's Panchapasaka, Smartos, but if you were to divide it up into two simple groups in South India, there's two main groups in South India. The two main groups are Vaishnavs and Shaivas. These are the two main groups. And they hate each other. They don't mix. It's like oil and water. Sometimes they intermarry. It's a weird thing. <laughs> they do that together. You get, you get you know, this kind of a com complex, exogamous, endogamous marital system to keep everybody mixing so you don't get you know, kids growing up with um, hemophilia, hemophilia, what is it? What's the, what's the term, the medical condition? Hemophilia, right? Yeah, they don't grow up with blood disorders and such that you get from marrying too close to your family. So there's some breakage there, but for the most part, Vaishnavs and Shaiva have, have nothing to do with each other. You know, it's a weird thing in, in Bengal. Sometimes you have Vaishnavs marrying um, shock does also. <laughs> like it's like that's that's the way they do it in their family. Mm -hmm. uh, well, they also those two tribes don't get along at all either. And so there's a lot of Vaishnavas in South India, but they all worship Vishnu. The worship of Krishna is much less standard in South India. You have the Madhvas. They are in Karnataka. And then you have the Ramanujis there in South, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, deep south of India. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went there. And he converted people. But they already accepted that Vishnu existed. They already accepted that God existed. They already accepted that the Vedic scriptures were bona fide. And they already accepted that Vishnu was God. Which might seem like it's easy. But it, it was it's quite something. They sometimes say that the, <coughs> the good is the enemy of the best. Because if you have something good, you become complacent. And so oftentimes it's very difficult to explain to someone from South about Krishna. They get hung up. Narayan is with Lakshmi. Krishna is an avatar. His character is not that good. He has so many gopis. Narayan, it's much cleaner. He just has one wife. It's Lakshmi Devi. They have a very respectful relationship. Radharani gets angry at Krishna. Sometimes she chastises Krishna. It seems like... A, it's a, it's a difficult fit. Lakshmi, Narayan, they're married. It's a very respectful relationship. She's super chaste, right? Radharani is married to Abhimanyu, so they say, who knows? And Radha and Krishna, are they Swakya? Are they married or they're Parakya? They're unmarried. It gets really complicated in North India. And so for South Indians, they just avoid the whole mess and they worship Lakshmi Narayan. Sometimes they might worship Sita Ram. That gets a little complicated too. 
Ram rejects Sita repeatedly. Sita leaves Ram eventually. We're back into the earth. Ram didn't raise his kids, love and kush. He made her do an Agni Pariksha. Nobody even wants to get into that. That's just, how would you justify that? And so Ram's a little more complicated. Krishna is extremely complicated. And so we go on and we do missionary work in South India and we convert Vaishnavas, we convert Ram Bhaktas and Vaishnava means Vishnu Bhaktas. The word Vaishnava is a patronymic, it means of Vishnu. And we convert them to becoming Karshnas, Krishna Bhaktas. And it might seem like that's easy. But you can name 50 generations of your forefathers. You've been worshiping Vishnu. You're following the Vedic scriptures. Maybe you don't follow the Srimad Bhagavatam, but you follow the Harivangsa, the appendix to the Mahabharata that has the pastimes of Vishnu. You follow Ramayan. You have the Alwars. Even in South, they, they, Tamil poetry is like on par with Sanskrit. They, they, they consider their language to be sacred. Sometimes they're aware that the Aryans came in. They're like, no, we are the real Hindus. There's a whole debate, even although Hindi is the lingua franca for all of India. Many places you'll go in South India, they don't speak Hindi. They don't want Hindi. They speak Telugu, they speak Tamil. Karnataka, they mostly speak Hindi, but especially the deeper south you go, the less likely they are to speak Hindi. And Hindi is 70% Urdu, only 30% Sanskrit. And they consider it to be a, a language which was corrupted by Islam. They don't want to have anything to do with it. You, you've noticed this, right? You're aware of this, right? You're Gujarati, you're like, you might as well be from Pakistan or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're, we're very good friends, so I can tease them like this. Uh, but yeah, we, we then, we do all kinds of missionary. We preach to people from South. We preach to the Shaktas and Bengal and other places also. And then we also preach to atheists. And we also preach to people of other religions and share our faith with them. And we don't ask them to renounce their other faith or give it up or decry it or repudiate it. But we do have people from other traditions who become a part of our tradition, like Kishori Radhika, who's from Korea. She was raised in a very strong Christian household, right? I mean, she's part of our tradition. So that would be an example. Or actually, Ryan here um, was a Christian priest. And he, he now he's a member of our tradition. So we do this kind of stuff. If you're like a mixed up Hindu, who doesn't know what you're doing, we'll get you too. You have a bunch of pictures on your altar and you're worshiping all the gods. We'll point out how philosophically untenable polytheism is. How no one actually believes in polytheism. Where the different gods are like lusty superheroes fighting with each other and you have to propitiate to all of them. Or somebody might throw a... Uh, lightning bolt at you and you want to cover your bets then you just worship all of them we'll point out the philosophical weakness of this and how it's actually not what's taught in the Vedic literatures that by following such a practice you're, you're actually going against the Gita we'll make this um, anyway so somebody 
an ex-military person, person called me today and she said, I have doubts about Krishna. This is a Western person. I think they're from Arizona. They had doubts about whether Krishna's got him. And they asked me this question. And they said, can you help me resolve my doubts about whether Krishna's got him? Or whether this whole Krishna thing is true or made up? And that's what I want to talk about today. How would you respond to that question? Generally speaking, people who were born Hindus, and this would include my children, they're not so good at this stuff because they were raised in the faith and therefore they never converted and therefore they never had these questions and therefore they can't answer these questions, which is a problem. Because if you can't articulate why you believe what you believe to an interested person, you're all but useless. And your faith is at best blind and it's not gonna help anybody. Turn your phone off, please. And your faith's not gonna help anybody. How are you gonna help anybody? So this person asked me, what's this whole Krishna thing? Is it true? Is it made up? How would you respond? non-rhetorical question okay krishna spoke the gita of course there's no evidence of that and then in the gita it says krishna says he's god okay and you have to think like this because if i told you what somebody said five thousand years ago You'd want evidence. You'd want evidence. But the oldest manuscripts we have of the Gita aren't that old. Now we have some, they're written on parchment, so they don't last a thousand years even, but we have some older inscriptions on stone and stuff like that. That gets us further back. But where's the evidence that Krishna personally spoke the Gita. I mean, he didn't. It's Sanja. <laughs> so you've already got Sanja. And Sanja wasn't even there. Sanja wasn't an eyewitness. Dhritarashtra wasn't at the battle. They were some distance away. And Sanja did something called remote viewing, something the CIA got into in the 60s, where they would think really hard and they'd be able to tell you what was going on somewhere else. So now to believe that Krishna spoke the Gita, I have to have faith in Sanja. And that Sanja was able to remote view a conversation. <laughs> and so it gets tough. Hey, I'm not even, I'm not even getting, I'm, I'm not even, I haven't gotten to the big one yet. I'm just warming up, <laughs> just having fun. It's gonna get worse. <laughs> and now, Krishna says he's God, so what? I'm God. And now what, he's going to go and preach to her? And she's going to go, why is Chukram God? You know, Chukram says he's God. That's my proof. So how is somebody saying they're God? I mean, that would legitimate the Bible or the Quran or any other book, just as much as the Gita. And it wouldn't get us anywhere such an appeal to authority only works for people who are already part of your congregation. It's never gonna, it's an entropic system. It's closed. There's no entry point because no intelligent person can get into your tradition because you just basically say, oh, well, that's what our books say. Yeah, but if I'm asking you, is it true or not? My asking you, is it true or not? Is evidence that the book isn't enough for me? Like if I say to Ryan, hey, give me your money, and Ryan goes, why? I can't then say, because I said so, because I already said so, and if he's doubting me, then it means me saying so isn't enough, and it shouldn't be enough. Since when is somebody saying they're God enough that therefore you accept them as God? That's ridiculous. Can, I mean, how many bad things happen in the world 
based on that logic. We, we don't accept that logic for anything. In a court law, that would be accepted. In a dispute between husband and wife, that would be accepted. N nowhere would that standard of evidence be sufficient. But somehow, for the most important thing in the world, we're supposed to accept that standard. Oh, we have a book, and the book says Krishna is God, so there you go. Well, this other book says he's not. Flip a coin. Yes. I don't know if I've answered to this. This is a very old question, and a lot of people have answered it. You like Prabhupada's answer. I doubt you know Prabhupada's answer. But we'll find out. I'm I'm going kind of big. I'm saying I don't think you know Prabhupada's answer. I think you're gonna give me your answer and you're just trying to make your son stay as Prabhupada's answer because it gives you it gives you more authority. But I'm pretty sure you don't know Prabhupada's answer, please. Prabhupada said, if I say it, you will believe it. Yes. Yeah. You will have to find it out yourself. And other other say it's also answer. And I think that's the scientific answer. You have to I'm not aware of Prabhupada saying that answer. I mean, I've read everything Prabhupada ever spoke or wrote. I've read all of his letters. I think there's like 11,000 of them, if I'm not mistaken. And I've read all of his books. And I've also read all of his conversations. I'm not aware of Prabhupada ever giving that answer. I will tell you one story, though. One time I was sitting almost where you are, but on the bench. No, I was over here. I was over here. And someone came in the temple. And we were talking, getting to know each other. He goes, I like Krishna. Krishna's my favorite God. <laughs> and I said, please tell me why. He said, Krishna's your friend. He's the kind of God you can go and have a beer with. <laughs> this was a deshi. Indian gentleman said this to me. I was quite shocked. <laughs> And he said, you know, and again, and Krishna, in the Gita, Krishna says, life is a game, so play it. <laughs> and I, 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 I said, just give me one second. And I went and got a Gita. And I said, please show me in this book where Krishna says life is a game. <laughs> or, so play it, or both. I'll give you credit for any, any of those statements. And I sat there with him for 10 minutes while he sweated and looked through the book like it was painful. And he kept trying to go, ah, and I go, no, no, you please, you find, it. keep looking, you'll find it. And I, I really, I dragged it out. Then I told him Krishna didn't say this. Now, Prabhupada may have said this, I don't think he did. So I'm throwing down the gauntlet. You find the statement, send it to me. Um, go ahead. So this to extend this a little bit, make it more practical. I was there and my father was there. Oh, all my life. So I didn't know my If the standard of evidence is that I have to be there, right? Something like that. I was in there and he was there. So I take it on the field. Got it. I'll respond to that. That is a terrible argument, but hold on, hold on. But you said it very well, and it's a very common argument, and I'm gonna to respond to it, not in great, great detail, but I'm gonna I'm gonna concretely respond to it. And I'm gonna get back to you, so don't go anywhere. I'm coming for you. If I want evidence of what time it is, I will just say, hey, Katie, what time is it? Or in fact, I'll ask a stranger. I'll ask any stranger that I don't know. What time is it? Who's wearing a watch? Or even has a phone, what time is it? I believe him. I don't know him. We've never met, right? But I believe him. Because that is an appropriate standard of evidence for finding out the time. Now, if I want evidence of what my bank balance is, I won't just ask him, what's my bank balance? That standard of evidence is not sufficient. 
I'll check my bank account, which involves entering a password and my fingerprint or making a phone call or going into a branch. There's several different ways I could get that information. And then I will trust that information on the screen, even though it's just a symbolic screen. It's made up of ones and zeros. And, and, and it's, you know, or I'm talking to just a, you know, an employee who's getting paid $20 an hour at the, at the branch and they're looking at a computer screen, but I'll take that as sufficient evidence. I'll talk to somebody on the phone who I don't know. But the, the stand of evidence just asking him is different than the stand of evidence I would require. And, and we also have, we have a preponderance of evidence. Now when you get into a legal situation, a preponderance of evidence is 51%. Then with more serious trials, you have another set of evidence called, nope, you have clear and compelling evidence, clear and convincing evidence, I've seen it both ways. That's 80%. That's in different standards. In some civil trials or in some criminal trials, that will be the standard. Then you have your highest standard of evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. And so even within the legal system, we have three different standards. And within your life, you have many, many different standards. So certainly um, a paternity test or the word of your parents is generally sufficient to determine um, uh, um, your parents. And I think that's reasonable. I don't think that my mother told me is enough to establish who God is or whether or not God exists. Because your mother's not an expert in whether or not God exists or who God is. Your mother is not necessarily, has not necessarily seen God, but your mother was there on the day you were conceived. And so you can trust her to be honest about that. Um, but I don't believe that that standard of evidence is reasonable. And so as you invoke a particular standard of evidence, which works for one thing, that doesn't mean that that standard, standard of evidence is gonna work for something else. However, Prabhupada did give that argument. And so it's better than yours. Because <laughs> Prabhupada said that, but in a serious discussion with somebody, that's not gonna be enough. I would argue that you did not become a Krishna devotee because of the Bhakti Gita. I would argue somewhat um, uncomfortable because you're my respected friend who I have great admiration for and who I consider to be my bosom buddy, my Priya Bandhu, my dear friend. I would argue that you became a devotee because of me. I convinced you. The book was there. I used the book, but I spoke to you. We spoke for hours and hours and hours and hours over months and months. And you went from being a nominal Hindu, a general generic Hindu to becoming a pure Vaishnava. And then I introduced you to my gurus also, including your guru Maharaj. And their example and their precept continued to ratify Papa gave this argument um, to a professor at Cal State Berkeley, a Sanskritist, who was debating with him. And Prabhupada said, our proof that Krishna is God is our devotees, mm -hmm. their purity and their realizations and their words prove Krishna is God. He gave that answer to a college professor. And so the answer, you trust your mother, is an answer which would work on a schoolyard or amongst friends. But when he actually got pushed, Prabhupada gave that very unusual answer. Our Vaishnavas are the proof that Krishna's God. I have a whole different way of talking to people about Krishna being God, which I'm gonna share with you now. And I did a long wind up, so I'm gonna have to go fast. But Prabhupada didn't say to each his own, Although I don't think you're wrong. I think you're right. Prabhupada did say you got to ask your mother. But he didn't say that when it was a really serious debate. He said what I said. And in fact, that's what happened with you. And I say that as someone who has great respect for you as a Vaishnava. 
And so I'm not trying to put you below me. It's just, I was here. We met, I remember. Um, I want to share with, with all of you how you convert people, at least in my opinion, how you convert people. And I get asked these questions a lot. And so I, and I was reflecting today on how I would answer this lady's question. And I thought you might find, you might find it interesting. I don't think it's the only answer. I do think it's the best answer because that's why I use it. And when I find a better answer, I'll start using that. So I do think it's the best answer, um, but I don't think it's the only answer. Adir Prabhu, we have a seat for you right there. Welcome yeah. Prabhu, really good to see you. I said to this lady, I said, well, what would you accept as proof? So if we want to start the conversation, I'm pretty sure I can prove your Christian's God, but you have to let me know at the outset, what would you be willing to accept as proof? I always start these discussions like that. Because there is an epistemic responsibility that you acquire when you ask someone for proof, and that is that you have to decide what you would be willing to accept as proof, clearly communicate that to the person you're talking to so they know where the goalpost is. Otherwise, if you're enigmatic about what would consist of proof, then you can just move the goalposts on somebody and they can give you good evidence and you can just continue to be a doubting Thomas with no legitimacy for your doubting position. And so to keep everybody honest, when you say to me, hey, prove this to me, I'm like, no problem. What will you be willing to accept as proof right now? And generally speaking, that creates a paradigm shift in the person you're talking to. And they stop being so lazy about asking for proof and so judgmental and condescending. And they realize that they have no idea what they would accept as proof. They haven't even thought about the subject. Like, is, are quantum mechanics real? Is black box radiation real? Is electromagnetism real? Prove it to a three-year-old. Does it, make, does it make it any less real? A good argument, good evidence requires a qualified questioner and a qualified answer. You need to have a good answer. You need to have a qualified person to judge that answer. Like, imagine... Uh, Like, you know, Nittai is uh, Gujarati. And so I could say, um, you know, Rumali chapatis? You know Rumali chapatis? Those real thin chapatis? You know them, of course, right? You don't know them? Okay. You know? Did I pronounce it right? Rumali chapati, right? That's the proper pronunciation? Because you're born here, you don't know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Well done. So we could have a Sachimata, Ajapu's wife, could make Ramali chapatis. And I could ask Ryan, are these authentic? And how could Ryan answer? He, he can't judge the evidence. But I could ask. Nitai to judge the evidence, and he could easily judge the evidence. Yes, these are authentic. How do you know? I grew up reading these bubbles. My mother made these for me all the time. All summer long, she used to make these. And so when you're looking at evidence, the person has to be qualified to understand the evidence that's being submitted. And whenever you ask a question, you look for proof you acquire a responsibility to determine what good, fair evidence would look like for that thing that you want to have proved to you. And then you become bound by that standard of evidence. And in fact, this happens at the outset of any trial. They tell you what the standard of evidence will be for that trial. Before any debate, this is done. Any formal debate, this is done. Even as a doctor, he ties a doctor, you'll talk about what is a reasonable outcome to be expected. You will, you know, you being a successful doctor 
and treating someone. They may have all sorts of fanciful ideas and you can't necessarily satisfy them. You can, according to the standard of care, do your job properly and give them a reasonable outcome that to be, is to be expected. But if they have some fanciful idea of what's gonna happen, that, that's not your fault. Their ignorance does not oblige you to an unlimited engagement. Even you go for a massage and you're like, oh, my shoulder still hurts. Like, yeah, you, 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 tore, you, you tore your rotator cuff. I'm not gonna give you a massage and your shoulder's gonna magically be better. Like, oh, I want my money back. You're like, yeah, that's not, that's not a reasonable expectation to have. I can, I can release some of the muscles around your torn rotator cuff. I can't repair your torn rotator cuff with a massage. Come on. So I asked her, what would you accept as good evidence? And she was quiet. I said, do you even believe in God? She said, yeah, I believe in God. I said, do you believe in an all good and all powerful God? And she said, yeah, I believe in an all good, all powerful God. And then she said, but what I don't agree with is why, if, there's, if God's all good and all powerful, then why are there so many religions in the world? And I said to her, well, let's think it through. I said, if I was to talk to your school teachers and your parents and your friends and your spouse, and I was to ask them to describe you, would they all be describing the same person? And she said, yeah, I go, would they all give me the same description of you and your qualities or your personality? She said, no. And I said, exactly. So how is it that, like, why if Krishna exists, why would that mean that everybody everywhere in the world would have to have exactly the same opinion? Do you follow this? Does that make sense? Then she said, all right, good point. Then she said, and she says, you know, I thought about it and ultimately there is no evidence. No one can ever know whether God exists or not. And I said, that's interesting. I said, if God was all good, would he want you to be able to know him? She said, yes. I said, if God's all powerful, would he be able to construct this world in such a way where he could make it possible you could know him? And she said, yes. I said, so the idea that you can't know God is incompatible with what you just told me you accept about God, which is that God's all good and all powerful. And in fact, if you truly accepted that God was all good and all powerful, that doubt would never have arisen in your mind that you couldn't know God because all good God would want you to know him and all powerful God would make it possible. At this point, her mind was blown. And I was like, okay, I, I, get, <clears throat> I gotta go to class, but we'll talk, we'll talk again soon. We'll, we'll do some more. I think for the most part, when you want to convince people Krishna is God, don't. Convince them God exists. They tell you they believe in God, don't believe them. Because them having a blind belief in God is not the same as them having a philosophically coherent understanding of what it means to believe in God. Just force them to start at the beginning. And you take these two principles, that God exists and that God is all good and all powerful. It could be three principles. God exists, God's all good, and God's all powerful. And with that, you will be able to answer 90% of somebody's questions. If they don't believe in God, it's like a flow chart. Then you go in a different direction and you give them evidence for believing in God. And my best evidence for believing in God is the irreducibility consciousness combined with logical versions of the cosmological argument based on irreducible complexity in the universe and, um, and, and fine tuning within the universe. And the most prominent instance of that is the irreducibility of consciousness. And now that indicates the source of the universe is also conscious. But that's my argument to get you to believe in God. Then I got other arguments to get you to believe in all good, all powerful God. Uh, namely, I like to define goodness as um, the ability to do the right thing with nothing stopping you. 
and evil is not actually a choice, like choosing a fork in the road, but evil is actually weakness. It's the inability to do the right thing because of selfish interests, lust, anger, and greed. But the deed was all powerful and beyond such things would automatically be all good because there'd be nothing mitigating his ability to always act in the best possible way. I like that argument. I also like the argument, an anthrop anthropomorphic argument, where we look at what's best about human beings and we're the most close to Krishna because we're the only ones with developed consciousness who could actually potentially understand God. Therefore, by looking at us, we would see the most representatives of God within this world. When we look at human beings, we find that kindness and love and so on become the most important features of reality. And therefore, we have to find those things in the deity. And the fact that those things don't exist in the lower forms of life in nature doesn't mean that those things should not be ascribed to God because we are the species that's most like Krishna, most like God. That's a, a, a subsidiary, secondary argument I make, which is actually quite good. It just takes a long time to make. Um, and so we're theomorphic. And by looking at us, we can understand something about our parents. To make it simple. Then you get to the God exists. And now Krishna's God is a cakewalk. Because once you believe that God exists, what you're really doing at this point is you're looking at competing conceptions. I gave you the example of if you walk onto my car lot and I'm selling Teslas, for example, and you say, why should I buy this car? My first question is going to be, do you need a car? And if you say no, well, then we got to start with a more basic conversation about whether or not you need a car. And then once we decide that you need a car, we'll find out what you need a car for and we'll see if the Tesla is a good fit for your needs. But you got to participate in the conversation. I got to get information from you. Once you believe in an all-good, all-powerful God, now what you're really doing is you're inspecting conceptions of God to see if they meet that criteria and how refined they are and how good they are, how coherent they are. And then if you see, let's say, for instance, eternal hell, is eternal hell comp compatible with an all-good, all-powerful God? It is not. So any tradition which teaches an eternal hell has a critical deficiency. Maybe they got some good stuff too. I'm not saying they don't, but they have a critical deficiency. And you can start to look at different conceptions. Knowing that God's all God and all powerful, you can then look at conceptions of divinity and you can start to say, hey, this is a good one. This isn't a good one. You're in the market for a car and you know what a good car is. You know what your needs are. And so you can start to examine cars and what's the, what's the torque and you know, what's the, what, what kind of gas mileage do they get? And, you know, What's the size of the engine? How many horsepower is the engine? And they're all important. What's the torque with the engine? What kind of pickup do you get? And how fast it goes zero to 60? You know, different people have different needs in their car, right? How many people does it sit? How much can you haul? What's the curb weight? What's the price tag? You have a bunch of questions you can use. But you're in the market for a car and you know what you need. So now you can start to look through ideas. Now we get to introduce them. Once somebody has become educated enough to understand the evidence, now you introduce the evidence. Do you believe in God? Yes. Yeah, I don't believe you. Let's talk about it. Anyway. Do you believe God's all good and all powerful? Yeah, I do. Yeah, we probably haven't really thought about that because you're going to start contradicting yourself in the next 30 seconds and saying stuff which is not compatible with an all good and all powerful God. And we're going to spend some time in that universe and get you all sorted out, get you all cleaned up. Once that's done, now we can start to look at the deity. And the beautiful, loving conception of divinity that's in the Gita. And where Krishna, and here we go. You ready? Where Krishna trumps Narayan and Ram. Ram abandoned Sita. Krishna became Arjun's charioteer. Krishna gave up everything for Arjun, gave up his arm, gave up everything to, draw, to be Arjuna's chauffeur. A chauffeur in India is super low class. Suttas, traditionally charioteers were suttas. They were a shudra class. Karna was a sutta putra. He couldn't even compete with the Pandavas. He wasn't even allowed on the battlefield. Krishna became that for Arjuna. Krishna dances with his devotees. Would an all good God want to dance with you? Could an all powerful God make that miracle happen? 
Would not good God want to embrace you? Could not powerful deity create the universe where you could embrace it? You could start to take these principles and you can use them to inspect our tradition. And our tradition is brilliant and coherent and deep and profound and has something amazing to contribute to the world. So certainly I'll introduce the Gita, but I do it in that order. Let me say it again, and I want to give you a verse in the Gita, and I want you to use this lens when you look at this verse. And we got to go quick. You start off, what would you accept as proof? And just watch them spin around and say nothing. What would you accept as proof? And just be quiet and look at them. And watch their brain explode. And then ask them if they even believe in God. And if they don't, go into that argument. And if they do, still go into that argument. And then start to define the qualities of God, namely the two important qualities of God that get you everywhere. They solve 90% of your problems. What are those two qualities? That's it. And then point out how you can use those and start to troubleshoot their erroneous ideas and then eventually get to where you can take them to our text and look at it. Let's now use that to look at this text. Tell us what Mam anusmara yudhyacha. Therefore, at all times, remember me and fight. In other words, do your duty. Mai arpita mano here. Offer your mind and your intelligence to me. Mame vaisesiya samshai. And you will come to me without any doubt. Asia C means you will come. The second person is saying you. It's in the future tense. You will come to me. Mame vai certainly. Eva means certainly. Mame vai si a sangshaya without any doubt. Sangshaya means doubt. A sangshaya means no doubts. Tazma, therefore, sarve shu kale shu. Sarva kale. Therefore, in all times, at all times. Sarve Shukale Shu is in the locative. It means in all circumstances, in all times. Mam Anusmara, remember me. It's an instruction. I think it's in the imperative. Mam Anusmara, remember me. Yudhyacha, and you fight also. These are instructions. And then, Mayi, to me, Mano Budhir, Arpita. Mayi, Arpita, Mano Budhir, offer. Arpita is from Arp. It means to offer something. And so offer your mind and your intelligence. Place your mind and intelligence in me. And then, you will certainly come to me without any doubt. Take the idea that God exists, that God is all good, and that God is all powerful. Just assume God exists. Take the idea that God is all good and all powerful and prove this verse is true. Go. I don't have to ask you to blindly accept the verse. You've accepted God's all good and powerful. I can prove this verse is true just based on that. This verse now becomes evidence I'm a bona fide tradition. I don't use this verse as evidence to prove I'm a bona tradition. This verse becomes evidence I can then use. You follow? The verse helps me make my argument. I don't need to get you to blindly accept the verse. I don't need you to accept it at all. How can I prove this verse is true based on the idea that God's all good and all powerful? Here we go. Wouldn't all good God want to make it easy for you to go back to heaven? Yes. Would he always leave that door open for you? Absolutely. Would he force you? He would not. Wouldn't all good God want you to have free will? Yes. Why? So you could love. He would give you free will. And in some ways, give up his own omnipotence because he's giving you free will so you can truly decide what you want to do. 
Would an all good God want to do that? Yes. Could an all good, powerful God make the world like that? Absolutely. So then what would that deity require from you? An all good, all powerful God, just for you to open the door. How would you open the door? With your mind and your heart and your actions. Because your actions without your heart, they're just business. And your heart without your actions is hypocritical. If you love somebody, and you're faithful to them. The proof of your love is shown by your action. But there's a devotional quality where it's not just transactional. There's also heart behind it. What's Krishna asking for you? He's asking you to do your duty. Is it important to do your duty? Sure, he constructed this world so you could do your duty. Would it be reasonable for God to ask you to do your duty in this world? Absolutely. Could it extend extent of fighting for Arjuna? Absolutely could. Nothing inconsistent about that. For the protection of others and self-defense, we don't even consider it a crime. Violence for the protection of others and self-defense is not considered a crime. You're innocent. There's no crime. Self-defense, no crime. So God created this world so we could have freedom. And then how do we properly engage this world? We do our duty, which is mentioned here. And we also offer our heart to Krishna. Also mentioned here, it's a cognitive behavioral relationship. It's what you do and how you feel. And Krishna just wants you to engage with him. And if you do that, that's enough. He'll take you back. Could an all-powerful God take you back? Absolutely. Would an all good God want to do it? Yes. Would he do it if you did nothing? No, because that would be violent and that would take away your free will. So an all-good, all-powerful God would leave us with a situation like this. A synergistic world where you have certain duties to perform, you have a certain quality of heart you have to have and receptivity, and that's enough. That's enough for grace to occur and for you to come back to it. And we live in a miraculous world where we live in a world where this world, which gets us into so much trouble and seems to just, you know, be a waste of time and, and gets us so implicated and enmeshed, can also just very simply become a springboard for going back to heaven, for seeing God, for embracing God. And what's required? It's real simple. You do your duty and you think of Krishna. Would an all good God need anything else? Would you need anything else if somebody loved you? You would not. Would an all good God need anything else? He would not. Could an all powerful God construct a world like this? Yes. And so this is a worldview which is consistent with an all good, all powerful God. In fact, if an all good, all powerful God existed, this verse must be true. Doesn't mean I'm better than another religion. If another religion has verses like this, great then we can look at the fineness and the nuances of this verse, compare it to the other one, appreciate both of them, fulfill the criterion of an all good, all powerful God, and then look for special additional features of the verse that make it more poetic and more beautiful and more amazing. And we can start to have a higher level discussion and do some finer work. You guys see what I did? I used these ideas to prove the Gita was a legitimate teaching. Not that I asked in the blind accept the Gita to prove my idea about God. The book actually helps someone create their faith instead of working against them, but it only helps if you put them in the right position at the beginning. You have to get them in the right mindset. And the right mindset is, what would you accept as proof? Do you believe in God? Fork in the road on a flow chart. Whether they believe or don't believe, assume they don't believe. Introduce the idea of God and God being all good and all powerful, and then use that to help them understand what good religion would look like and then show them ours and watch their minds get blown by the beauty and the elegance and the depth and the profoundness of our tradition. And in comparison to that, Narayan must be the avatar and Krishna must be the source because Krishna is filled with more love and more intimacy and more accessibility, essentially more goodness but specifically love within goodness. And in this way, you can talk to someone from South, from North, from East or West, from far West, like here, from another tradition, an atheist, and we have something to tell them. And we can honor Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and do our outreach. And we may change the way we do it because we're living in a different time and place, but the essence of it's the same. We build on these concepts and we take people to a better place. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.